Welcome to Beyond the Legacy, an extension of the Civil Discourse and American Legacy Project. I'm Donna Phillips. Today, we go deeper into our series on civil rights in America. Uh, we are joined again by special guest, Dr. Lester Brooks, American history professor emeritus from Anne Arundel Community College. Welcome back, Dr. Brooks. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to go deeper into our topic of civil rights. And I wonder if you can start off by talking with us about how the decisions of our founders and framers um, shaped the challenges and battles uh, for civil rights. We can go straight to the Declaration of Independence because of the principles that were established in that document. Certainly these were ideals, uh, the revolutionary ideology, uh, all men are created equal. Uh, now certainly there were flaws, uh, but it puts us on the path to make a more perfect union. And certainly in the revolutionary period, we saw that in the black community. There were petitions uh, sent to provincial legislatures seeking emancipation. And so we can find this in Massachusetts, we can find it in Connecticut uh, seeking emancipation. Uh, later, um, the idea of segregation will come about. But again, we can go right to the uh, um, uh, Declaration of Independence. When we talk about that revolutionary period, uh, the Declaration of Independence and its principles sets us on a path to make a more perfect union. There was one individual at the time by the name of Lemuel Haynes who wrote a pamphlet uh, called Liberty Extended. And he essentially was saying that the, the Declaration of Independence should be extended to incorporate the black community and to incorporate others. And so we get these ideas that were generated in uh, the revolutionary period. Uh, the British offered freedom to those blacks that would come and support the British cause. So that was one option because the black community was seeking liberty. They were seeking freedom. Uh, certainly the uh, Patriot cause ultimately opened its enlistments uh, to uh, blacks as well to fight. So this idea of liberty uh, was embedded in the black community and, and, and freedom. Uh, and if we look at that uh, period, those principles were crucial. Uh, and they were sort of like a bedrock uh, for uh, people in this country, liberty, freedom, and certainly the words in the Constitution to make a more perfect union was something that people strove to bring about. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our country was founded very imperfectly with this goal of a more perfect union and these principles articulated in the Declaration and kind of codified by the Constitution, but they didn't apply to everyone. Absolutely. If we look at the Declaration of Independence, certainly uh, women weren't included, uh, blacks weren't included, uh, Native Americans weren't included, but the words themselves left an opening. Mm. And with that opening, uh, individuals began to uh, seek to extend those principles to a wider audience. And that's been the struggle in this country, mm -hmm. to extend the principles of the Declaration to a wider audience here in America and to incorporate all Americans. Mm -hmm. And so if we jump forward a little bit um, and we look at Frederick Douglass, um, and, and uh, his invitation to speak at the 4th of July celebration. Mm -hmm. um, what did he have to say about our civil rights journey? Frederick Douglass, one of the most courageous of the abolitionists. So here by the antebellum period, the early 1800s, we get the abolitionist movement uh, and Frederick Douglass was one of the key individuals there and his speech uh, what to the slave is the 4th of July, celebrates uh, that I the ideas of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and he continually talks about the Declaration of Independence and those principles. I'd like to quote Frederick Douglass uh, from that speech because I think it's very timely. Mm -hmm. Douglass says this, what have I or the those I represent to do with your national independence. 
Are the great principles of the Declaration of Independence extended to us? Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, pros prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The 4th of July is yours, not mine. Mm -hmm. So these are powerful words from Frederick Douglass who is recognizing the contradiction in the Declaration of Independence, yet he holds out hope. He's saying later in this speech that he still has hope for the future of the country, that things will work out. So he too saw that this was a struggle, that this was an evolutionary process, and that there is this slowly chipping away um, at uh, uh, the institution of slavery, that the principles of the Declaration of Independence would in the future be extended to all. In addition to Frederick Douglass, there were others in the abolitionist uh, movement that were fighting for civil rights. Uh, there was uh, a white individual by the name of William Lloyd Garrison, who also was uh, very outspoken. Uh, and one of the words that, uh, he, one of the phrases of Garrison I, I really like, uh, he said you can't, uh, the argument was should slavery be uh, abolished immediately or gradually. Mm. And there was a discussion at that time uh, about immediatism or gradualism. And William Lloyd Garrison, his argument was, you can't tell a woman whose house is on fire that you will gradually put out the fire. And that really captures a, a, a very important aspect here of abolishing the institution of slavery. He was saying we should immediately begin to uh, emancipate the slaves, abolish the institution of slavery. And I think his input is that he moved the, the uh, uh, abolitionist movement along mm -hmm. uh, and propelled it further down the cause of immediatism. Uh, there were others, Sojourner Truth also, uh, who was protesting for uh, abolishing the institution of slavery as well as for extending women's rights. So there were a number of abolitionists who were attempting to bring about um, the fulfillment of the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And we can't forget those individuals because they had a huge uphill climb to try and bring about the end of the institution of slavery. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so getting to the other side of the Civil War mm -hmm. then, we have the Reconstruction Amendments and how did they move the needle in terms of civil rights? The Reconstruction era uh, was a profound uh, period in American history, in particular for the freedmen. The 13th Amendment abolished the institution of slavery. This is major. This is changing the status of black Americans forever. It's abolishing the institution of slavery. Of course, there is that question was dropping the shackles, was removing the shackles, was that enough? Was there more? Uh, do you have to put flesh on this? What else is there than just dropping the shackles? And so uh, we begin to see a, a Civil Rights Act. 1866, there was a Civil Rights Act, and this was the first attempt to try and put some flesh on that 13th Amendment, a Civil Rights Act. And usually we don't think about civil rights acts, uh, civil rights act in that period of Reconstruction. But the Civil Rights Act of 1866 essentially was saying that the freedmen would be citizens of the United States, uh, and essentially they were trying to nullify what were called the black codes that were popping up in the southern states that were restrictions placed on the black community, keeping them without property and without power, without influence. So here we get a, a, a Civil Rights Act in 1866. Uh, the 14th Amendment comes about. 14th Amendment at the time essentially was saying that blacks were citizens of the United States. So again, putting more teeth uh, to that 
Civil Rights Act of 1866. The 14th Amendment talks about citizenship for the freedmen. It also talks about the equal protection of the laws. Mm -hmm. And I think that phrase is gonna be extremely important in the 20th century because the 14th Amendment will be used time and time again to extend the principles that were presented in uh, the Declaration of Independence and uh, the words of the Constitution to make a more perfect union. The 15th Amendment, the Voting Rights Amendment. Now, it was carefully crafted at that time, carefully worded because it left loopholes. Uh, for instance, in, in crafting the wording, no one wanted women to vote in that time period, so it was crafted to continue to keep women from voting. It was uh, also, it allowed loopholes to keep blacks from voting. So. Uh, here we get uh, the poll tax. If you want to vote, you have to pay. Let's say uh, you have to pay a dollar. Well, majority of blacks didn't have, the overwhelming majority of blacks didn't have a dollar, uh, and so they would not be allowed to vote. And if I'm the white registrar, even if they have the money, I won't let them vote. Uh, poll taxes. There were also literacy tests. Uh, if, again, I'm the white registrar, and a black person wants to vote, I'll say, here's a paragraph of the US Constitution. Read that paragraph for me. Now, approximately 90% of the freedmen could not read coming out of uh, uh, slavery. So uh, again, the idea of a literacy test is gonna exclude many in the black uh, population. But again, if I'm the white registrar and I do find one of the percentage, a, a, a black person that can read, now my question will be, read that paragraph and explain it to my satisfaction, mm -hmm. which they will never be able to, to do. Uh, so that was another way to keep blacks from voting. A third method to keep blacks from voting was the grandfather clause, uh, an extraordinary tactic. Uh, and we've seen political tricks throughout the history of politics in this country. This is an extraordinary one uh, where I can say to a black person, I will let you vote if your grandfather could vote in the election of 1860. Well, certainly no grandfather, no black person could vote in the election of 1860. So I'm not in violation of the 15th Amendment because I'm not using race as a means of keeping that person from voting. Because again, the way the, the, the uh, 15th Amendment is crafted, it says race. And so I'm not keeping individuals uh, from voting based on their race. I'm saying because your grandfather couldn't vote, you're not allowed to vote. Now there will be uh, another, uh, so, uh, there'll another, there'll be another case, um, Reese, U.S. versus Reese, I believe it is, where the court will say the, the 15th Amendment doesn't confer. It just says why you can't keep people from voting. It doesn't say that you have to actually vote. So uh, there were a lot of ways to play with that, uh, uh, the loophole in the 15th Amendment to keep individuals from voting. The grandfather clause will last into the 20th century. Literacy tests will last into the 1960s uh, where in the 1960s, I might say to a person who wants to vote, here, read this paragraph of the state constitution, or copy this paragraph, or copy the entire uh, uh, state constitution. So the literacy tests are gonna uh, last uh, into the 1960s. So that fight is gonna last a, lo uh, a very long time. Uh, with regard to the 15th Amendment and voting. So when we look at the Reconstruction Amendments, as they're, they're called the 13th, 14th, and 15th, they move the, the needle tremendously. They open the door. Now, certainly there were drawbacks. There were still obstacles to overcome. For example, 1875, we get a Civil Rights Act. Again, now 1866, we have one. 1875, a Civil Rights Act essentially said that inns, hotels, theaters, uh, accommodations should be open to blacks. Well, there are a number of cases such as the uh, Civil Rights cases of 1883 where the Supreme Court 
spoke about dual citizenship. In their interpretation, they're saying the 14th Amendment says that uh, the state cannot deprive you of your rights, but an individual in the state can deprive you of your rights mm. because you have rights, uh, national, uh, national citizenship, you have state citizenship, but the 14th Amendment only covers you as far as uh, the nation and it says the state can't do these things to you, but an individual in the state mm -hmm. can. So certainly the owner of the inn can say, you're not welcome. Uh, so there were these obstacles that still lingered, uh, even though there were these attempts to bring about uh, a more perfect union. Uh, and so in that reconstruction period, there was a tremendous fight. There were uh, boycotts, uh, there were race riots, uh, and there were civil rights acts in, in this attempt to bring about a more perfect union. And largely historians say uh, it, by the end of Reconstruction, uh, most of them were failures. And so we're gonna have to sort of repeat some of these things 90, 100 years later. So, and so going into the 20th century, uh, what was the ongoing landscape for civil rights? Some historians say this is a low point. Uh, and the reason they point out uh, this is because of lynching. Mm -hmm. uh, latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of lynchings. And one individual who focused on that was a woman by the name of Ida B. Wells Barnett. Uh, and Ida B. Wells Barnett was a very courageous individual. She owned newspapers. She was a newspaper editor and she fought against lynching. She wrote pamphlets against lynching. She wrote newspaper articles against lynching. She tried to mobilize people. Uh, she appealed to uh, the presidents and leaders uh, to pass legislation against lynching. And uh, she tried to investigate why lynchings were occurring. Uh, and she found out one of the reasons was economic competition, that when blacks uh, established economic uh, businesses and concerns, if they were in competition with whites, one way to defeat them is to uh, lynch them. So uh, uh, lynching was one of the more horrendous activities at that turn of the century, and Ida B. Wells Barnett was one of the individuals who fought against that. Also, at the beginning of the 20th century, we have uh, the, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And this was an organization with civil rights as its focus. And one of the key individuals there was W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was the only black person in a leadership uh, position in the NAACP. Uh, and so we'll see that throughout the 20th century, the NAACP uh, took a lead in bringing about lawsuits because one of their key things was to establish legal precedents, bring about civil rights through a, uh, court cases. Uh, and that was one of the most important things that they were able to accomplish uh, throughout the 20th century. And we'll see time and time again, going to court, petitioning courts to try and bring about uh, change. Uh, so at that turn of the century, uh, the struggle is continuing. Uh, still the ideals of the Declaration of Independence are there. Uh, the words of the Constitution to make a more perfect union, they're there. Uh, and so we see it in the early part of that 20th century, even though it was a very uh, um, intense uh, uh, period because we're in the middle of segregation, 1896 we get the Plessy versus Ferguson case that established a separate but equal doctrine, that it was okay to have separate uh, uh, theaters, separate water fountains, uh, separate everything, as long as facilities were equal, even though in practice, facilities were unequal. Uh, you could have separate uh, uh, railroad cars. Uh, and, and so here, this was the, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, segregation. Uh, and so the fight is going to be 
to try and bring down segregation, to open up society. And that's what we're going to see time and time again in the 20th uh, uh, century. And the NAACP will be right in the middle of this fight to bring about uh, an end to uh, segregation. Mm -hmm. and, and so going forward a little bit more then, um, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit more about the Brown versus the Board of Education decision? and its impact on segregation and then civil rights ongoing. When we look at this, uh, uh, the 14th Amendment, we have to go back to that, and that phrase, the equal protection of the law. So in the field of education, before we even get to Brown, there were attempts by the NAACP to bring about the equal protection of law. For instance, there was a, uh, the pay with teachers, black teachers, were paid less than white teachers. Uh, facilities, uh, black facilities were, uh, uh, funds for black facilities were a lot less than funds for white facilities. Uh, uh, and so this idea of uh, fighting to equalize pay, equalize funding for facilities was all part of this move toward the Brown versus Board of Education. There were also a number of cases leading up to that. For instance, there was the Gaines case, uh, Lloyd Gaines uh, in Missouri in 1938, uh, wanted to attend the University of Missouri Law School. The state Supreme Court said that he was not allowed to attend the University of Missouri, but the University of Missouri would have to pay his way to a neighboring state's law school, right? Uh, now, ultimately, he uh, never goes uh, uh, to the University of Missouri Law School, but, uh, but the idea that he would have to go out of state and University of Missouri, uh, that's what the state Supreme Court said, that they would pay his way. The United States Supreme Court stepped in and said the University of Missouri has to accept him. But again, based on that 14th Amendment equal protection of the law. There was another case, McLaurin versus Oklahoma, and this is 1950. McLaurin, black student, wanted to attend the University of Oklahoma Graduate School. University of Oklahoma admits him. However, he has a designated seat in the cafeteria that he has to sit in. He has a designated seat in the library where he has to sit. When he goes to class, he sits outside of the classroom with the door open or there's a shield put up. White students on one side, he's on the other. Mm. Uh, the US Supreme Court said, no, you can't have that in school segregation because that's depriving him of his equal rights to gain a graduate education, the mixing of, uh, uh, with the other students. Uh, and so there were a number of these cases that lead up to the Brown versus Board of Education. And that Board of Education was the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And uh, uh, there was a school basically right up the street. Uh, and uh, the Brown family, uh, the child had to go uh, much further than to attend that school. And so there was a lawsuit. Uh, and ultimately, the Supreme Court says that uh, segregation in the field of education is unconstitutional because it deprives those individuals of mixing with others. Uh, and so we get this tremendous uh, decision. However, a year later in 1955, the Supreme Court says to desegregate with all deliberate speed, which now means what? That can be defined a lot of different ways. So now we begin to see delay tactics uh, to prevent the integration of schools. And there were all sorts of, of uh, uh, delay tactics to try and stop the integration of schools. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, there was one school board, this was in Texas, and the state legislature said that if any school board desegregated their schools before allowing the people in that district to vote on it, then they were subject to punishment and jail. Mm. Again, trying to delay. Uh, in Louisiana, there was one school board that said their investigation showed that what should be done is wait until the aptitude of blacks 
reaches the aptitude of whites. But that is impossible under the conditions at the time. Uh, so we get a number of delay tactics uh, with that uh, decision. But one thing that many of my students uh, didn't understand, they were under the impression that the Brown decision destroyed the Plessy case altogether, mm -hmm. uh, destroyed segregation. And it didn't, it only destroyed segregation in the field of education. There was still the problem of segregation in transportation, segregation in accommodations. And so once we get to the field of, of uh, transportation, we can turn to the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, and again, uh, usually when we hear about the Montgomery bu bus boycott, immediately the name Rosa Parks comes to mind. And I always tell my students, Rosa Parks was a pivotal figure, but she also worked with the local NAACP. Uh, and so she was not innocent. She understood the circumstances. Uh, she had been working for civil rights uh, before this. She had even been sent to investigate rapes of black women before this. Uh, so uh, she knew exactly what she was doing. Uh, sometimes we only hear Rosa Parks and we hear about Martin Luther King in the Montgomery bus boycott. We don't hear about Joanne Robinson who belonged to the Women's Political Council there in Montgomery, who was pivotal in helping to keep the bus uh, boycott going on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, she was cranking out the leaflets that were sent out uh, uh, to call for a boycott, uh, and she continually helped to mobilize people to support the boycott. Uh, and so uh, there were others who were involved in uh, that Montgomery bus boycott other than Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, not to take anything away from them. Uh, also in transportation. So here, uh, they're literally chipping away mm -hmm. at the Plessy versus Ferguson separate but equal doctrine. And that Brown chipped away a little bit. Now the Montgomery bus boycott in transportation. We can also go to the Freedom Rides. Uh, the Freedom Rides were organized by the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, which was founded by James Farmer. And this was an absolutely incredible endeavor. Uh, this, the Congress of Racial Equality, an integrated group, they were gonna start in Washington, D.C., and they were gonna ride the uh, Greyhound bus from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, this is an integrated group. So the black members would go into the white section of a terminal, the, the uh, white members would go into the black section. And, and so what they were trying to prove that uh, desegregation uh, had taken place. Before they got on the bus, they were writing down next of kin in yes. case something happened. Um, so, you know, just, just that, the courage mm -hmm. to continue on and as individuals, uh, uh, many people know that eventually they ran into all sorts of problems. Uh, they were beaten at different spots. Uh, they were hit by clubs and chains. Uh, the bus was burned at, in, in one spot. So just an, a tremendous effort. It got to one point, the farmer had to call off the, the uh, trip. Uh, and so, again, this was an attempt to bring about the end of segregation in the field of transportation. Uh, so there was that fight going on. There were other groups. And I wanna mention uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference led by many ministers. Martin Luther King is perhaps the most famous individual connected with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But also for a brief period, there was a woman by the name of Ella Baker, who also served as an officer in SCLC. Ella Baker many times gets overlooked. Tremendous individual uh, who fought for civil rights for decades. She had more experience than King at organizing and uh, fighting for civil rights. Uh, and she was gonna be heard. 
uh, she did not uh, bite her tongue. She was going to be heard. But what's amazing is there was the sit-in movement in the early 1960s where college students were sitting in in various uh, uh, locales. Now, it started, um, one of the places it started was in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina a t students went to a local restaurant and sat in. And then you get sit-ins uh, throughout the South. Ella Baker said they should organize, and she helped them to uh, bring about an organizational meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina. And out of that comes the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, and so Ella Baker was instrumental in that. Uh, and she told uh, uh, the St Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, commonly referred to as SNCC, that they should be independent from SCLC. Mm. And these were young students, some of the most courageous Americans you will ever read about are these young people of CORE and SNCC that engaged in the sit-ins because there were rules. When you went to sit in at a restaurant, you could not respond to the treatment. Uh, so if you're sitting at uh, uh, the uh, a counter and someone pours a Coke over your head, you can't respond. If someone pours ketchup over you, you can't respond. If someone takes their cigarette and burns you in the back, you can't respond. If you're punched, you can't respond. So there were these rules that were established and the young people that were engaged in this were absolutely amazing. Um, and you can't say enough about some of these individuals who were uh, involved in that, in the movement, uh, the sit-in movement, uh, the freedom rides, uh, going into voting. Uh, if we, if we uh, talk about, well, let me mention uh, accommodations, because I said we talked about uh, the education, mm -hmm. destroying Plessy in the field of education, destroying uh, Plessy in the field of transportation, but also there was a fight to destroy uh, Plessy in the field of uh, accommodations. And one place to look to see uh, this fight was in the Birmingham campaign. And certainly there is Martin Luther King in the middle of the Birmingham campaign. And one of the most important documents of the modern civil rights struggle was his letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, that is a must read because he explains, many times people think that Martin Luther King believed in turn the other cheek. He did not. He believed in nonviolent direct action. He said you go into a community and you nonviolently stir things up. You cause a commotion and force that community to address the conditions the unbearable con conditions, the oppressive conditions. So it's not turning the other cheek, it's non-violently forcing the community to deal with the oppressive conditions. And that's what he was doing in Birmingham. But he wasn't the only one. Uh, there were, a man by the name of Fred Shuttlesworth was already in Birmingham. And Fred Shuttlesworth is again, another one of these courageous, civil rights fighters. At one point, he wanted to integrate the local high school with his daughter. And his, he, his wife, and his daughter drove up to the school, and they're attacked by a mob. Uh, the mob is beating him up. His wife gets out the car to try and help. She will get stabbed. Uh, the daughter will try and get out. The door uh, will be slammed against her, her leg and broken. Mm. So Fred Shuttlesworth is just so courageous because he continually fought and fought and fought. And uh, the violence that, you know, Birmingham was nicknamed Bombingham because so many bombs went off uh, in, in the community. King threatened at Montgomery uh, with bombs. And at one point, Coretta Scott King was sitting in the house talking to a friend and they heard a thump and they ran to the other end of the house and the bomb exploded, uh, damaging right where they had been sitting. So these were sincere threats. These were 
uh, really some serious times and, and people are afraid. One of the phrases in that song, we shall overcome, is we are not afraid because people had to convince themselves that they had to stand up against the violence that was being thrown in their way. Uh, and people gathered some support in that way. They had meetings um, where people could stand up and give testimony. Uh, uh, they had rallies where you could see people in the community coming forward and that gave you uh, some support and the courage necessary to carry on uh, the fight. Uh, so in the accommodations, uh, partly the Birmingham campaign helped to bring about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, mm. uh, which opened up uh, accommodations. But think about this. We can go all the way back to 1875. In 1875, there was a Civil Rights Act that essentially said the same thing that the 1964 Civil Rights Act said, open accommodations. Uh, and so we see a 90-year period, uh, and the struggle, again, is continuing. We can also look at voting, voting rights, uh, because as we've seen, uh, uh, the 15th Amendment uh, allowed for loopholes to keep blacks from voting. So there was, again, this attempt to bring about the expansion of voting rights. And one campaign that dealt with that was the Selma campaign. This campaign, the idea was to march from Montgomery, from Selma to Montgomery. And that was uh, about a 50 mile march. And that's what they were gonna do, uh, to protest. And they would march out a few miles and then uh, some would go back to Selma uh, to spend the night and then they'd march a few more the next day. Some would stay right where they ended the march. But the Selma campaign, and just to show you the intensity here, people died. Uh, and throughout the, this entire movement. But for example, uh, there was Jimmy Lee Jackson, uh, a young man who a, a police officer was uh, harassing his mother. He stepped uh, in to protect her and was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. uh, a white male by the name of Reverend James Reeb walking down the street and there were several individuals that came toward him and one swung a two by four, hitting him in the head, killed James Reeb. Viola Liuso, a white housewife from Detroit who drove down to participate in the Selma campaign. Now, she was shuttling the marchers back and forth from Selma to the place where they had stopped. And one night she had a young man in the car, uh, in the front seat, well, uh, a car full of Klansmen drove up, shot into the car, killing Viola Liuzzo. Now they get out, look in the car, and they see her blood was all over the other person as well. And he played dead. So mm -hmm. they thought they killed him and got back in the car. And the, the reason we know what happened is one of the members in the car of Klansmen was an FBI informant. Uh, so here's this Detroit housewife who believed in civil rights and loses her life. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, uh, the Selma uh, campaign, but this also helped to bring about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And certainly there were other protests going on to bring about uh, voting rights, the expansion of voting and to get rid of the literacy tests and any other obstacles. Uh, so the Voting Rights Act said that, yeah, there could be an investigation. There could be uh, uh, federal officials that went into uh, to, uh, territories or areas or districts uh, where there had been discrimination in, in voting rights. Uh, so the story for civil rights in this country is long. Uh, but we can go right back to the Declaration of Independence and the principles presented there and that phrase in the Constitution to make a more perfect union. And we can see it all along the way that people have been struggling to expand the rights. And this is just one of the struggles uh, uh, for uh, black Americans. Uh, there's uh, also a fight going on for women's rights, uh, for gay rights, for Native American rights, uh, Latino rights. So there is 
still more room to, uh, to, to grow. Uh, we still have uh, that path to a more perfect union and we will continue. And as Frederick Douglass uh, says, he has hope for the future. Yeah, I like how you brought it back around to the words of the Constitution and striving towards a more perfect union. Do you, what, what would you say are the biggest challenges still facing us today? We still have a percentage of Americans that are not willing to expand the principles of the Declaration of Independence uh, any further. Uh, and that's what we have to do. We have to keep expanding the principles of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, now, certainly, um, there are individuals who are in power. They're in positions of influence. But also, we have to educate the people. We have to get the right people elected. Uh, that can uh, bring about the changes. And that's where we are right now, uh, that we have to continue educating individuals. And that's what we're doing here with this, civic education, uh, civic discourse. These are crucial. Uh, uh, placing a greater emphasis on American history, educating the American uh, uh, public uh, so that we can advance uh, further toward a more perfect union. So certainly we have problems. Uh, when we talk about all men are created, created equal, we're not there yet. Things are not equal. Uh, and we have to keep moving uh, toward providing uh, more equality in this, uh, a country and being more inclusive. Because we say we're a democracy, we have to be more inclusive. And one of the reasons we have to be more inclusive is Individuals have ideas. They have answers to some of the questions that are facing us. And we need those answers. We need uh, 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 people to bring that brain power uh, and that ingenuity to help us resolve some of the issues that we're still facing. And so when you're inclusive, you are bringing in more of those ideas and more of those answers that we need to make a more perfect union. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. Thank you. This has been Beyond the Legacy with our focus on civil rights. Thank you for joining us.